suit and tie And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one Who needs one? Because I've got some lines free for David Whiting, well-known Melbourne solicitor, who is here to help. one 774 is the number. So, do you got a problem? Do you got one? Is that, is that Nobody correct has English? Nobody has problems. Nobody has problems. We just have David, challenges. I think you fixed everyone's problems. Okay, good. Well, I can go no, now. No, we've now yep. got a full board. Okay. <laughs> Spoke too soon. Homework? Uh, no, I've had, um, had the weekend off. Thank oh, you nice. very much. Problems you'd like to share? No, no. I've got, some, uh, I've, I've got an absolutely fascinating probate file for a man who died without a will. Yeah. Uh, with no partner and no children. And it's, you know, I've, tracking down who can administer the estate has been extraordinarily complex. I think I've got a man who's the first cousin. I've got to prove he's the first cousin. How so are you going to do that? What I'll do is I'll look at the parents of the person who died, the, par- the death certificates for the parent of the person who died, mm-hmm. and the first cousin. And what I'm looking for is a sibling relationship between the parents. Right. And then I, and you look at their parents' names as they appear in the death certificates. I see. Okay. So if they've got the same parents. Yep. Yes. It's like being a sleuth. A it is. I, you know, it's you know, every now and then you get one of these, you just think, yep, it's an interesting... One of those Colombo matters. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I haven't got a trench coat anymore, but you know what I mean. Trench coat we can sort you out with. Okay. Let's start off with Shirley. Shirley and Croydon, you've got a question for David. Go ahead. Oh, good morning. Yes, we do. Uh, we've recently, or on last Friday, received a letter uh, saying the council wishes to put a, a heritage listing on our home. Yes. Now... Um, we certainly don't want this to happen. Uh, what can we do to uh, prevent this? Just before David answers, can I just ask you to describe your home for listeners? Why is it getting an historic register order? It was, well, it's, um, it's a significant house. A split level, skillion roofed, modernist house. Ah. Mount Gambier limestone construction, and it was built in fifty eight fifty nine. Who was the architect? Do you know, Shirley? Uh, he was a friend of ours, um, Robert Moore, but he's been long dead. Yep. Okay. Oh, so was there's, there's your problem, modernist. Shirley. You've decided to build something that's noteworthy. Mm. I mean, I look at some of the buildings around town that were built in the fifties and sixties, and I'm thinking. I mean, I rather like Treasury Place and the uh, sandstone buildings we've got around town. It's the it's the 60s stuff I'm not overly enthusiastic well, about. You're cr- well, you're crazy. The 60s Absol- stuff is absolutely fabulous. Though. There you go. So, look, surely we even have a... Dis- uh, a Your house have sounds a beautiful, here. Shirley. Wonderful. It does, Shirley. I mean, that's the problem. I suppose what you need to do... And the, the note from the pro- producer said historic buildings register... But this is actually under the planning scheme for Maroondah, is it? Yes. Okay. What you need to do is persuade them that your the building has no architectural significance and it's not appropriate. So it could be because of renovations you've subsequently made or it may be that the, uh, the registration that's given to your building under the planning scheme will only relate to certain aspects of it. Because I'm quite sure that there are not many houses in Croydon built with Mount Gambier sandstone. Well, I can, I know of one other not far from there it. There you go. Well, Marooned is pretty big. Oh, yeah, so, surely yeah. that's that you, it's up to you to make submissions to say no and this is why. And, okay. and the other thing that you would need to think about is to try and find out what the rating is they're proposing to give you and what the restrictions are under the scheme that come from that rating. So, for example, oh. I, I, I live north of the city and I live in an area with a heritage overlay, but the heritage overlay relates to the streetscape and not to my house. So there's issues like what colour can I paint the front fence? Yes. Okay. Okay. Shirley, yeah, so may, may I ask just before we let you go and you have your conversation with Marunda, why you don't want the um, the heritage listing, what that prevents you from doing? Well, we're both um, quite senior mm-hmm. and possibly we would want to sell it uh, to downsize shortly. Yep. And I feel having a heritage overlay 
would affect the price of the building. Well, maybe I can help, Shirley, because I can tell you that there is a booming market in Melbourne for exactly those kind of mid-century modern homes. In fact, there are, there are specific agents who sell those homes, who deal with only those, and there's a waiting market of buyers who are trying to find them. So when the day comes, if you haven't touched the hair on its head, you actually could be sitting on a gold mine. Really? Really. <laughs> Re really and truly. And if you stay listening to ABC Radio Melbourne, is it Wednesday or Thursday, Joe, that um, that our friend Mr Modernista is going to be joining us, Tim Ross? Uh, Tim Ross, who is the Thursday, who is the modernist exponent of, of, of modernist building around the country, is coming in. He's got a new show on ABC TV about exactly that. And if I describe to him this house in Croydon, David, he may want to buy it himself. He may indeed. <laughs> so, honestly, to anyone who has an intact anything, whether it might be from the 20s or from the 60s or from the 1880s, intact and untouched, always valuable. Right. Okay. I'm not a lawyer. I know okay. a little bit about or architecture. Or a valuer. Or a valuer. Indeed, so I'll shut up there. So it's an appraisal rather than a valuation. Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a friendly suggestion. Okay. Um, Tina in Thornbury. Go ahead, Tina. Uh, good morning. How's it going? <laughs> Not bad. Go ahead. I have a personal protection order against my neighbour. Yes. And so basically, um, I've heard this discussed in the past in your show... <laughs> Um, she's very um, mentally unstable. Yes. I've been the victim of various incidents, multiple incidents whereby uh, she's approached me, she's thrown water over me, I've called the police, they've promptly arrived. Um, no, no, um, no arrest. So, uh, uh, Tina, what, uh, it seems to me, Tina, that you want... So you want her to be taken to court for a breach of a protection order? That's correct. Uh, have but you the specifically is, asked the police for that? Well, no, I haven't specific, specifically asked as such, but the issue is um, when I've presented in court, for example, the final court hearing, and I've raised the issue of being um, put under surveillance, which is my main concern and the reason for my call, um, i.e. she's got two large bullet cameras, we live in the Office of Housing. Now, there are two issues at stake here. One, she's breaching the rules in public housing, which... Um, there, but, but, but rules. Tina, Tina, that's a rule for public housing yes. between the office that provides public housing and the tenant, not between neighbours. So you could, you could do a couple of things. One of the things that you could do is you could go back to the uh, ministry and you can say what I would like to do. Is, I want you to enforce this so that the cameras don't point at me. You could also, you could also go, back, go back to the magistrate's court and seek to vary the order and, in, and, and seek the removal of the cameras. That's failed. What I'm actually seeking is um, I need to know who is higher up as such. The, the, the magistrate at the Melbourne Magistrates Court basically suggested that I reach out to someone higher up. In the past, I've reached out to the sergeant and they repeat the same thing. When I called the police recently... So what do the police say? That she is entitled to a quiet enjoyment on the property despite putting me under surveillance using um, various... Um, her her quiet devices. enjoyment and surveillance are different. Uh, are, are the camera... Does she say the camera's alive? What does she say? Yes, they've confirmed. They've confirmed... The police have actually confirmed to me recently, a couple of months ago, at my front doorstep. We live in a block of flats. Uh, they confirmed that she has a ring doorbell camera, which is situated at the end of my stairs, which... I have to access... It's my understanding, Tina, that part. that particular camera doesn't act, isn't activated till you press the button saying, please let me in. So what should Tina do in well, this Well, Tina can turn around and she could, she, uh, she could seek a review of the magistrate's court decision not to vary the permit. Mm -hmm. but, so the lady's got a... The neighbour's got a camera on her doorbell, which mm -hmm. lots of people now have, but the camera generally doesn't work until you press the button. Okay. Otherwise, there'd be a camera running all the time. So she can... Higher up might be that she might be able to appeal the decision in the magistrate's court. 
um, it's th that's her option. Okay. Or she could bring her own proceedings for contempt. For contempt. Well, it's con well the, no the police have contempt the right the to order. enforce the order, yeah. but there's an order for Tina's benefit. Tina can go to the magistrate's court and say, uh, um, or launch her own private prosecution for for contempt, okay. for breaching an order. Good luck, Tina. We hope that's helpful. Uh, Peter in Eltham. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. I've um, got a neighbour with a very loud pool filter um, who we've discussed um, using that filter for shorter hours and not overnight. Um, they've turned the overnight cycle off, but it, it runs 12 hours a day. Um, and it's it's quite noisy. It's like a, you know, a gentle industrial noise that really... So it's, quite... give us a comparison. Is it as noisy as someone running a generator, say, or not quite? Yeah, yes. Uh, that's probably in the league of, uh, yeah, a, a small generator, yes. Peter, you've got to prove that the noise would be unreasonable to the general population. Do you know what the generator is? So what, what I would filter. be trying to do... Well, yeah, sorry, uh, something... Filter. There's a motor which is creating the noise. Yes. You, yes. I think you need to know what the motor is. You need to know whether baffles exist or are required. Uh, it's, it's, it's simply you can't object to every noise that comes from your neighbour's property. So you're interested in, in the level of the noise, the source of the noise, and, and, um, and whether there is something that could be done to ameliorate the sound. So they're the kinds of things you need to look at. Will your neighbour tell you that information, do you think, Peter? I doubt it. Um, uh, relations know, are not good? No, no, relations are all right. Yep. They're, um, but, um, you know, it's, it's a pool filter that probably needs a lot of work and it's just it's buzzes away um, uh, to keep, you know, what was once a green pool now clear. So one of the things that you need to also, well, you might also look at whether or not, if you know the volume of the pool and the size of the motor, it might be that you could run it for shorter hours. That's what I would really like to see, yes. Well, why not ask the question and make the investigation? All right, and see if that conversation starts something useful. Thanks for calling in, Peter. I hope that's been helpful. Uh, Steve, Steve in Hampton. What's going on, Steve? Yeah, hi, David. Hi, Virginia. Um, I'm a snow skier and... Um I've purchased some early bird seasons tickets for my son, his partner and uh, two grandchildren. Um, $50, $49 deposit last October and the remainder came out in May this uh, year. Um, there's been a relationship bust up and I was trying to cancel uh, the partner's ticket which is uh, $899. Wow. They're, yeah, they're about 1000 bucks each or close to, aren't they, those yeah. season passes? Yeah. Um, well, they have a business model where they force you into buying these early bird passes because you can't afford two hundred dollars a day to ski. Yes, uh, I think encourage is the word we would use uh, <laughs> at oh, right, Steve. Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, look, I've, I've um, even before the majority of the money was taken out, um, their policy says that it's non-refundable, uh, non-cancellable. You can't transfer it, <laughs> and you can't defer it to another season. <laughs> Um, they're just intractable reference any sort of a refund. Mm. I, I told them about the relationship bust up and explained what stress the family was under and they just won't budge. Um, I was wondering whether what options I had, if any, to pursue them to try and get the $899 back. I was locked in. Because they were all on the one purchase, I was locked in. I couldn't just cancel my year. Take one out. Oh, there you go. Next time, next time this happens, you'll buy them individually, won't you, Steve? Exactly. Right. <laughs> uh, Steve, there is, uh, under the Australian Consumer Law and Fair Trading Act, there's a concept where you have the ability to argue that a particular provision is unfair. So if it's an unfair contract term, you could argue that, the, that it's unfair. Right. Right, so the question is whether or not it is in fact unfair... So here I am, what I'm doing is I'm giving you a... It's a use it or lose it deal with an individual's name on it and as a result I will give you... So how long is a... How many days skiing would be available on the typical season? Oh, well, the season uh, with any luck runs for a couple of months but we'd normally go for a couple of weeks. No, 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 hang on. But what we hear is this. You can day... On, the, on your numbers, you can have 60 days skiing for 800 bucks. Yep. Okay. And, and as a result of taking on that offer, you get it. You, it's significantly better than 200 bucks a day. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. So the question is, is it unfair if I give you a mammoth discount where I bring your average ski cost, potential average ski cost, down to 15 bucks a day? You just, but for days you don't use it, you don't get any benefit. 
I, I um, tend to think the the quantum of the discount they're offering may cause you may, may may encourage a tribunal to say in all the circumstances that's reasonable even though you're not going to use it no, no but but you took that risk last october mm. i mean you could have broken a leg oh yeah but the, well they do have an before you got policy. there as opposed to out there sorry yep. yeah well, well they have an insurance policy called epic coverage which gives you lots of outs like um personal injury but not service. loss of a relationship no. No. Sorry, Steve. All right. Well, I hope that's helpful. One three hundred triple two seven seven four. Steve in Cranbourne. Go ahead, Steve. What's your question? Today, thanks for taking my call. I've um, just got a question about a will. So, um, my wife and I got wills done um, probably about five years ago. Yep. Um, so and we've separated. Um, we're not divorced. Um, my question is: Is it easier for me to? start again with a new will. I want to change the benefactors and executors and that sort of stuff there. Yes. Um, um, I only have a PDF copy of it. Yep. Um, would it be better to start again or alter what I've currently got? Oh, well, no. If you've only got a PDF copy, you don't have the will. You've got a copy of the will. Yep. Okay. Right? So the other will exists until such time as you change it or you tell the lawyer to turn it, tear it up. Um, if you were to tell the lawyer to tear it up, your current spouse would probably still inherit anyway. So my suggestion would be, if you like, you can write out a new will using the template that you've got, change the executors and the beneficiaries, and you then that get that signed. If you don't want to use a lawyer, you can get a kit at a newsagent, or there's a pro forma will in the back of the law handbook, which you can get at thelawhandbook.net.au. I think we should have a little game. Whenever anyone mentions the law handbook, there has, should be, I don't know, a bell should go off in the studio or something. Yeah. Are we going to give some away this year? Aren't I? We yeah. usually give law handbooks away Yeah, every it's a year. bit early in the year. Too early? To yeah, too early, but okay. it'll happen. You'll let me know, won't I you? I will. It's one of my favourite days. Martin in Brighton. Hi, Martin. What's going on? Hello there. Yeah, so pretty much um, I bought a van. Um, it's now done less than 40,000 kilometres and it's spent 110 days at Renault. It's um, a lemon. Yeah. you got a lemon. A total lemon. Last week, it broke down last Monday, and then I had it for two days before it broke down again. <laughs> and it went in on. It went in last Friday, and I picked it up yesterday. It only did like fifty, sixty kilometres before it broke down. Um, so describe describe breaking down for me, Martin, or you describe breaking down. Well, well, pretty much what they're saying, you see, I bought a Renault traffic van thinking yes. that I could use it in traffic. And now they're telling the me... The spelling's not the fault. same. There's only one F there's, in the sign. And also there's I know, one, one well, C, you, I think. So I bought a Renault traffic thing and I'll be able to use it in traffic. And I'm, I live in Brighton and I'm a local electrician in Brighton. And they're saying it's my fault because I don't take it on the freeway once a week um, for 30 minutes. And because I don't do a completely useless journey of taking it on the freeway no, no, no. 30 minutes. <laughs> Virginia, you're smiling. I'm rolling can, my can, eyes can at what I they're say, telling you. No, what? no. I had a client who... So it's a diesel, isn't it, Martin? It's a diesel, right. yeah. Right. So yeah. I had a client who lived in Brighton and worked in Richmond. Yeah. And they had exactly yeah. the same problem with an English four-wheel drive. Right. And the argument that was put by the manufacturer was, is that you've got to let the... You've got to run the diesel... Right. ...rather than just potter along. So every now and then you've got to clear the particulate filters. And if you don't, it will... They they have a system that causes the engine to shut down. And is, when, that, and when is that what's going on with you, Martin? That's why well, it's shutting yeah. down? But the whole thing is, yes, that is exactly what's happening. But the okay. point is that, that I did a lot of research before I bought this van. And, and nowhere on the manual, now on the website, they didn't tell me when I bought the van that this would happen. I spent money having sign writing put on it, putting racking on it. I spent about 15000 on it. And now they're saying, well, it's your fault. You've got to go and buy a new van. Or, you know, I should have known this. It, and, yeah, I mean... Well, if there's no information, David, if there's never any warning about you must take... I wouldn't know to take a diesel out on the road 30 minutes a week. I wouldn't. OK. Clearly you haven't bought one. No. No. OK. <laughs> uh, that's, but uh, I had a friend who had a little diesel car and she potted around town and it didn't break down. They're, they're now fussier about uh, discharges. OK. So, 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 so what can Martin do? Drive it for half an hour a week on the freeway. Because you've got so, to so, prove so, that so, it's so, a so, fault so, so with the vehicle. Hmm? I'm going to come back that they sold me a vehicle that's not fit for purpose. Well, how closely did you tell them what your purpose was? 
So if you walk in and say, I want a Renault traffic model number such and such, and then they've given you a vehicle that matches your description. If you come along and say, I never draw a drive for more than 10 minutes at a time, uh, is this the vehicle for me? Then you've relied on their advice for the choice of the vehicle. Yeah, but, but before before I had this vehicle, I had a, a Toyota Hiace that I had for 15 years. It never broke down once in sort of... You know, um, 120 kilometres, 1,000 kilometres. It um, too was a diesel, Martin. Diesel. It too was a Sorry? diesel. It too no, was a diesel. No, that was a petrol one. But, but, but when I bought this van, no one told me this. I'm just going to buy a van, a new van, and it, well, there was no information this would happen, and they didn't tell me this. And it's, well, it doesn't seem fit for purpose. It's, uh, it's not my fault. It's, I mean, it's, surely they should be asking me what I'm, how I'm driving the van. You can't expect... I mean, if it's a Renault traffic van, you think you'd be able to use it in traffic. Well, you can. You've just got to keep it running for quite some period of time. I, I had a friend who lived in Carlton, bought a diesel, and the advice he got from the dealer was take it to the take it to the airport once a week, right? Yes. Just up and back the Tullamarine Freeway. Hey, Martin, I don't see that it's not fit for purpose. But so if, if, you, this, if you think it is, then it's off to VCAT. Would this problem be entirely solved, Martin, by taking it out to the freeway, out to the airport once a week? Would the problem go away and you'd have the truck that you want? Well, well, well they've, they've said that, but, but I've done it like... OK, um, so, so the so solution is ago, within I, your grasp. When, when, when I did it two weeks ago, I'd actually gone to the morning pinch room back yep. and it broke down the next day. Oh, did it? Um, and, there, and there was another time I was driving to um, Shepparton and it broke down on yeah. the way to Shepparton. Wow. Ma- Martin, so Martin, you need an engineer's report that says yeah. what's wrong with your vehicle. The fact that it stops, because it's the cause of the stopping mm. which is the issue, not the stopping. Well, Martin, we'll have to leave it there. So an engineer's report might help. Would, well, uh, without he, it, you would go nowhere. And then he can go back to the manufacturer and say, look, guys, this is what's going on. Yes. But you don't think at this stage Martin has any argument to say you've sold me the wrong car? I, I, I would need to analyse the conversation Martin had because Martin did research. Yes. Martin decides I want this van for this size for this purpose. Because it's called a traffic. Yeah, there's only one F in it spelling. And it's one C, and if I remember correctly. But there's only one C in traffic he, if you, in the English language. Really? Oh, you're quite right. Yeah, I don't okay, know why I had a K in my mind. But, but in the vehicle, it's <laughs> one F. Yeah, I know. I've seen, I've seen it on the back. I don't think it's a reasonably good basis on which to decide. Right. I'd love to disagree with the you. Na- the, na- the name of a, the, a car. The car, yes. The yes. model number. Yes. No. no. Uh, all right. Good luck. Sorry, Martin. That's a terrible predicament. David, thank you as always. See you next week. We'll see David Whiting next week. Sorry if we didn't get to your legal calls. Try again next week. As always, more people than we can get to in the half an hour we have allotted.